to the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's one way to get your commissioners to come back in the room. Let's <laughs> <laughs> start. Uh, we're playing. <laughs> we we're playing fruit backs get upset today because um, Commissioner Benega is going to be leaving a little bit early. Um, with that being said, I'd ask you to silence your cell phones. Um, the meeting documents are on the end by Commissioner Kelly that have all the agenda in it with um, supporting documents. Robert in the front row has listening de devices if you need them, and just see him and he'll set you up. Okay, I guess we're ready. Uh, routine business, item number one is consider a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries five to zero. Item two is to approve the county commission minutes of May 21st, 2013. Move approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Those aye. opposed, aye. same sign. Motion passes five to zero. Item three are bills to be paid in the amount of $436,226.35. Move for approval. Second. Any discussion? Commissioner Burke. On uh, today's bills, there were uh, 130 individual bills for mental health ranging from $15 to, $15 to $2,600. Thank you. Any other comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes 5 to 0. There are no reports today. Item 5 is personnel. Item A is to approve the routine action. Do we have a motion for routine action? Move for approval. Second. Any discussion? Any comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes 5 to 0. Item B is consider a motion to approve conversion of one budgeted part-time legal office assistant for the Public Defender's Office into a full-time legal office assistant position. Jenny Addix. Good morning, Commissioner. Jen Addix from Human Resources. A part-time legal office assistant in the Public Defender's Office has tendered her resignation. Tracy needs a full-time legal office assistant, so she'd like to take this opportunity to convert her part-time position into a full-time position. I know you've gotten a memo about this already. If you have any questions, I can certainly answer them for you. Any questions or comments? Uh, just a comment. Now, she indicated in there that she can do that within her existing budget, so I think it's important we keep that in mind. Any other comments? Move for approval. Second. Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes 5 to 0. Item B is consider a motion to approve salary increase for Carrie Bentz, Assistant Director of Human Services. Uh, because of the additional responsibilities that Carrie has taken on, um, not only since she started, but particularly in the last two years with her management and development of the Safe Home Program and the Jail Reentry Program, the Human Services Director, Carol Muller, would like to increase her salary by 5%, moving her from a 21.6 on the pay matrix to a 21.8. Again, I know you've received a memo about this. If you do have any questions, either Carol Muller or myself would be happy to answer them for you. Any comments or questions? Seeing none. I'll move for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes 5 to 0. Thanks. Thank you. Item number six, or application for abatement. Kyle Helseth. Good morning, Commissioners. Kyle Helseth, Equalization. We have quite a list this morning, and there is one basic reason for this list in that the City of Sioux Falls only considers the abatements once a month. So we receive all of these in floods. These properties are all located within the City of Sioux Falls. So the first one is the point is to serve. This was granted exemption by the County Board of Equalization. Record ID 59542 in the amount of $24,520.19. So moved. Do I have a second? I'll second it for conversation. Comments? Commissioner Benega? Uh, Kyle, can you give yes. me a little more detail about uh, where this property is at? And uh, I mean, this is an unusual, quote, church property if that's what it is yes it was one of the properties that uh, we called into the Board of Equalization to make the presentation I believe Pastor Kiesbo was here and made the presentation on the point to serve it is a Baptist quote-unquote church 
for a lack of uh, a better denomination to use. They did purchase the property on Kiwanis Avenue across the street from the racetrack. And it had been taxed before. Bingo. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And that's what this is? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I have a motion and a second. Any additional comments? I'll be abstaining on this. Okay. I have one abstaining. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes four to four to one abstaining. Item B is for the Special Olympics of South Dakota, record ID number 84860. Property taxes in the amount of $1,151.56. This is another exemption that was granted by the board. Make that motion. Second. I have a motion and second. Any comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes 5 to 0. The next, uh, for lack of a better word, bunch which it seems to be our veterans exemptions that are granted and authorized by the state of South Dakota up to $100,000 for a veteran who is permanently unable to work, not disabled in a wheelchair, but unable to work, is certified through the VA. We check all of their paperwork. These exemptions were granted by the commissioners at the Board of Equalization time. And if you'd like, I'll go through them quick with the record ID number and the amount. I think that'd be probably a good idea. You'll notice that it takes, for a $100,000 house in the city of Sioux Falls, the taxes on it are $1,504.77. That's why that amount seems so consistent. Oh, okay. The first one is for record ID 73600 in the amount of $1,617.97. Record ID 442, this is a decal, a mobile home, in the amount of $67.01. Record ID 25414 in the amount of $1,504.77. Record ID 31063, in the amount of $1,504.77. Record ID 39356, in the amount of $602.47. Record ID 46875, in the amount of $1,504.77. Record ID 49780, in the amount of $1,376.96. Record ID 51698 in the amount of $1,504.77. Record ID 58227 in the amount of $1,339.86. Record ID 64418 in the amount of $593.66. Record ID 70605 in the amount of $1,504.77. Record ID 72383 in the amount of $342.20. Record ID 74566, in the amount of $1,504.77. Record ID 79662, in the amount of $1,504.77. The next three are for the surviving spouse of the veteran. They retain the $100,000 exemption until they remarry. Record ID 70608, in the amount of $1,504.77. Record ID 40059 in the amount of $1,504.77. Record ID 36994 in the amount of $1,504.77. The last is uh, record ID 46753. This is for a paraplegic veteran. For his 2012 property taxes in the amount of $1,575.99. I'm going to take them in a bunch to approve them all. It would be move to approve items C through T. There are 18 items. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any additional comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes 5 to 0. Thank Madam Chair. Yes. I would just comment. It's interesting. We got this uh, with the Memorial Day weekend here at the same time. And uh, I think that. Uh, visiting with Kyle that there are quite a few younger veterans that are now qualified under this and I, it's something that we as a community need to be concerned about the, our, our new veterans who are injured or whatever in our many wars. Thanks Kyle. And Pam. Hi. Um, I have one abatement today and it's uh, for ID number 23010 and it's for $902.60. I'll make that motion. Second. 
and a motion and a second for an assessment freeze. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes 5 to 0. Thanks, Pam. Thank you. Item number seven are notices and requests. Item A is the auditor's office is requesting authorization to publish a notice of hearing to consider an application for a retail on off sale malt beverage license and a retail on off sale wine license for the Riviera Riviera by Rocco's. The license property is legally described as lot two of tract one Genie's Edition, Northeast Quarter, Southeast Quarter, Section twenty eight, Township one oh one North, Range forty eight West. The property is located at 26665 481st Avenue in Brandon, South Dakota. The public hearing will be scheduled for June 18th at 9 a.m. to consider the two applications. Okay, and this is just an authorization or a request for an authorization for publication. Can I have a motion? Move to uh, authorize publication for a June 18th hearing. Second. I have a motion and a second to authorize publication. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes 5 to 0. There are no planning and zoning notices, and there are no petition for compromise of lien. The next item is opportunity for public comment. This is an opportunity for the public to comment on anything that is not already listed on the agenda. And seeing no one, we will move forward. Item 10 under regular business is to authorize acceptance of a proposal from Bill Garnos for inmate population forecasting and analysis update for Minnehaha County. Warden Jeff Gromer. Good morning. I'm Jeff Gromer with the Warden with the Jail. Um, we're just asking for acceptance of a proposal from Bill Garnos I'm here on behalf of the Community Corrections Advisory Committee and the Sheriff. Um, the proposal is for a inmate population forecasting and analysis update for the county. Uh, Mr. Garnos did the original forecasting when the jail, current jail was built. Uh, that proved to be fairly accurate and we would like him to update that with the considerations for the Correction Center and the Advisory Council. Um, the proposal is for $12,472 and there was a specific allocation of $100,000 in the building fund for work studies and architecture concerning the correction center. Any questions or comments for the warden? Commissioner I would just make a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, I think that this is the statistical information that's probably the most important part of our growth or hopefully alternatives uh, for incarceration that the governor uh, started with his program. I think we need a basis of uh, a good forecast. Uh, Mr. Garnos has done an excellent job for us in the past. Uh, the $12,000 is a small fee, frankly, compared to what we're spending in uh, incarceration costs. And I think uh, to have accurate information to get this process started so that we can look at alternatives is extremely important. So I would encourage your support. The time frame on this, I'm looking quick and I don't remember, is it three months? Yes. Um, he's predicting it'll be 128 hours of his time, but it was about a three month time frame where he found okay. he the Any additional comments or questions? No, sure. Sure. I, you know, I think that we are subject to quite a few um, vagaries of change. I mean, if we go to 0 .05 on the BAC, if uh, you know we raise the drinking age to 30, uh, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, uh, legalized marijuana, I mean, it's, it's difficult. I know that some years back we hired a, a company to do a space study on our campus here, and they came back after much ado and said we need more space. I, I predict we will need have more prisoners, and uh, uh, you know, I'm teasing when I say that. Uh, I do plan to support it, but I think it's really, uh, it's like asking an economist what the things are going to be in five years. It's difficult. Commissioner Kelly. Well, my understanding was that he was almost right on track with where we are today and what he forecast, uh, what was it, five, ten years ago. Uh, it's important even though there's, and there's been changes in the interim period, uh, particularly in the rates of violent crimes in this area, but uh, uh, I think this is really important for the committee to have and to see where we're going with the uh, CCC and with the whole with the whole new uh, 
the justice program. So I would support, urge your support. Any other comments? Looking for a motion? So moved. Second. Sure. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. Item 11 is to authorize the chairman to sign a contract between Minnehaha County and the South Dakota Department of Corrections to house juveniles in the Minnehaha County Regional Juvenile Detention Center. Ken McFarland. Commissioners, you'll recall that <clears throat> Mr. Cheever did meet with you uh, here a couple weeks ago to get your authorization as part of contract negotiations to raise the rate that we charge with the, for the Department of Corrections to house the juvenile in the JDC. The current contract rate is $245 and actually expires this Friday, I believe. And that, so the new contract uh, is for $250 a day. It runs from June 1st, 2013 through May 31st of 2014. Uh, Kirsten has reviewed the contract and we've noted that the only changes are some contract language regarding some uh, new federal acts and our responsibility to comply. And uh, we don't see that that's going to be an issue on, on compliance. So those are the only changes in the contract and we'd recommend your approval. Any questions for Ken? I'll, I'll, make, I'll make the motion. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. Item 12 is consider a motion to approve the submittal of juvenile accountability block grant application on behalf of the LSS Middle School Diversion Officer Program and VOA Community Service Program. Erin Serska. Hi. Good morning. I'm Erin Serska, JDI coordinator. And it's that time of year again to submit the JPIG grant. Uh, this year the funding did go down a little bit and next year it's going to go down significantly more. So we'll have to uh, relook at how we're spending that money next year. However, this year we want to continue funding a middle school diversion program. It's been very successful the first year. Uh, we have a diversion officer right in the schools to help the kids uh, get through and then also to continue help fund the community service program over at Volunteers of America Bowdoin Center. It provides our youth on diversion and on probation the opportunity to get connected with community agencies to complete their community service. And I'll ask any questions. I it's in the memo. Um, Commissioner Kelly. On the Lutheran Social, why is that not redundant with the school resource officer? Because it's a diversion program is uh, usually funneled from the state's attorney's office, not the done through uh, police officers. So. Okay. Thank you. It's for the evening report center. Uh, and, the and then the program. other heart there they have after school programming at the Bowdoin Youth Center so it also helps facilitate keeping that open as well any other questions for Aaron looking for a motion so moved second a motion and a second any other questions or discussion all those in favor say aye aye, aye. those opposed same sign motion passes five to zero aye. Item 13 is to authorize the chairman to sign an agreement with Geotech Engineering and Testing Services to provide construction materials testing for project MC 142 CONC-13 County Highway 142 pavement restoration and concrete joint repair. DJ Boothy. Good morning commissioners, DJ Boothy, Highway Superintendent. Uh, this agreement is for Geotech uh, local testing for materials testing firm uh, to provide uh, materials compliance testing for concrete and asphalt on our, our road project that is currently advertised and, and set to begin construction here soon. Uh, these types of contracts are typically 2 to 3 percent of the total construction contract price and uh, this uh, roughly $6,000 agreement is, is in line with that uh, construction cost estimate. If you have any questions about uh, the work or anything else, I can answer those at this time. Any questions? Uh, DJ, is this the only concrete highway we have in the county? Yes, it is. <coughs> I believe that it was originally a state road and that we took over, and that's how we ended up with a concrete road. Move approval of the uh, agreement. 
motion. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes four to zero. Item 14, consider a motion to approve the purchase of road salt from Central Salt and Hot Mixed Asphalt from concrete materials from contracts competitively bid by the City of Sioux Falls, DJ Boothy. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, both of these contracts were bid by the City of Sioux Falls. Uh, one of them is set to expire at the end of June. Uh, that is the salt, road salt uh, contract, and the City of Sioux Falls will be rebidding that, and we will uh, tag on to that project hopefully also. Uh, the the two contracts, uh, first the road salt, uh, the contract price is $53.26 per ton. Currently we were paying $58.58 per ton. Uh, annually we usually spend, uh, use about 5,500 tons and so this, sa this will uh, annualize the savings of about $28,000, just over $28,000. Uh, the hot mix asphalt uh, last year we paid $48.93 per ton. Uh, I would presume that had we bid this, it would have gone up a couple dollars per ton. Uh, but at that price, uh, there's a cost difference of $5.93 per ton. The City of Sioux Falls contract is $43 even. And uh, we're using 25,000 tons this year. Uh, we're proposing to use 25,000 tons. So, so this will result in a savings of just over $148,000. <clears throat> Excuse me. So between these two contracts, going with the city of Sioux Falls, we're saving uh, over $177,000, and uh, the the city is happy to uh, work with us on on coordinating these contracts. And the vendors are also very happy to to work with us. Uh, we have uh, letters of approval and the contracts in the bid packet or in the briefing packets that you received, and I can answer any questions about these at this time. Questions? Comments? Commissioner Park. I would make a motion to approve and then I would have a question. Have a second. A second. Uh, DJ, in the past, uh, occasionally we've bought uh, hot mix from a company other than the, the, that won the bid just because the location is closer to uh, the work site and the cost of hauling is such. Right. Uh, will we continue to do that then? No, we will not continue to do that. Uh, the way that this contract is set up, there's no provision for transportation costs. It's just a, a, a unit bid price for supply of material, and there's no provision for any type of transportation costs calculation. So if concrete materials has to take it to Sherman, that's the way it goes? We are the ones that transport it. We pick up the asphalt. But if, if we have to travel to Sherman, that's just the way that it goes. Yes. Okay. Hopefully, with the competitive bid process, we are still getting a better price anyway. So right with the savings of one hundred and forty-eight thousand dollars, with this, uh, that will offset the any transportation cost. Okay. Mr. McFarland. I would just like to remind the commission this is directly as a result of some of the changes that you instituted with the purchasing policy and, and how we bid these larger items and the requirement that we ask department heads to go through to check the city of Sioux Falls bids and the state of South Dakota bids, et cetera. And then, so um, I think this is an outstanding example of how that policy worked and DJ's to be commended for what he's been able to accomplish with this. A lot of money been, has been saved in the highway department and in several other departments by using the new policies that we've instituted. So thank you. Um, we do have a motion and a second. Any additional comments? look for um, all those in favor say aye. Aye. aye aye those opposed same sign motion passes four to zero item 15 consider a motion to approve the transfer of capital assets equipment from the Minnehaha County Highway Department's capital asset inventory to the Minnehaha County Parks Department capital assets inventory the equipment list is in the auditor's office DJ Boothy uh, commissioners this is basically just a housekeeping item uh, moving eight pieces of equipment that were listed in the briefing memo from the highway department inventory to the parks department inventory. I did incorrectly state on the briefing memo that this transfer will prevent future highway fund dollars from being expended on insurance for this equipment. Um, it was brought to my attention that those expenses were uh, taken out of the parks department for these pieces of equipment. So um, I don't think that there will be a financial impact because of this transfer, but uh, but as I said, a housekeeping item to make sure that the equipment is is 
is uh, under the correct department's inventory, I think is is uh, is prudent. Any comments, questions? I guess I would ask the auditor if he thinks there's any issue transferring them. Well, let's from the auditor's office. No, I do not believe there is. Thank you. I'd make a motion to approve. A motion transfer. to approve. Motion to approve the transfer. Yep. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes forward to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Item 16 is consider a motion to approve a county auditor's request to enter into independent financial advisor agreement with Public Financial Management Incorporated and to authorize proceeding with bond refunding process. Bob Litz. Good morning, folks. Uh, Bob Litz from the auditor's office again. And uh, today I do have uh, four items that I'd like to discuss with you. And uh, uh, the, the main idea here that's prompting this discussion today is the idea of significant savings to the county through a refunding of some of our debt portfolio. Uh, a while back, uh, uh, it was about a year ago that uh, we had a financial advisor come forward with a proposal for the county. And at that time, uh, it was a, called an advance refunding. And uh, the situation was that it was gonna save us $868,645 over an eight year period. And uh, there would be some funding fees of $65,000 up front, plus another funding fee of $65,000 uh, when that uh, event uh, would have taken place should it have happened. Uh, I, I looked at the situation, now on the face of it, it sounded like a pretty good deal for the county, and I'm always interested in saving the county some money. But it also involved moving 10 to $11 million worth of the county's debt portfolio, uh, uh, moved it around, and uh, you know I was uh, fairly new in the office, and uh, I'm also not an expert at bonds. So what I did was sought a second opinion. And with that second opinion came the idea that perhaps these rates would stay flat and that we should wait and there would be a serious benefit or a considerable benefit uh, to this later on. And, and uh, you know, as this time passed on here, here we are today, and it's true that, uh, you know, by waiting, we've, we've, we've doubled that amount of money. And so uh, that, uh, that advice uh, that I sought out was, uh, was well thought out and in, in, in it's of much benefit to the county. And uh, as a result of that, uh, the timeline that we got to go through, and I put that timeline in your folders. In your, does anybody, you, you want me to put this timeline up on the thing? Right. Sure. Yeah, but anyway, put that up there. our timeline for this, uh, this refunding starts in the beginning of June here. And there's some items that, uh, that need to be done fairly soon and, and that said I would I've also talked with uh, Jessica from PFM who is here today uh, she says that we do have a little bit of time but uh, you know things can change in that bond market and uh, could affect the outcome of the the deal here but the time is at hand here and that's that's why I'm asking that uh, we go forward with this uh, the other thing uh, the timeline and sequence uh, you know if there's uh, if there's some questions about that right now I'd uh, I'd like to no, you know, I'd like them at this point so we can move forward. Madam Chair, uh, I would ask a question on that issue. Okay. Bob, on uh, the email dated uh, May 23rd uh, the, uh, from Jessica Cameron to you, it says, I do not think the deal will no longer be available, which is a double negative, which means she does think it will be available. Well, or did I, she mean to say that it would not be available? And, and I would defer to Jessica here, and I noticed that uh, yeah, as well. I Jessica, would you please? Uh, I apologize for the grammatical okay. error. Jessica Cameron Mitchell, TFM. Uh, Just a grammatical deal there? It is. It is actually. It would still be available at this point in time within the bond market. And that could change. Okay. Well, honestly, um, with where rates are and where you're existing, uh, Could you speak into the microphone, sorry. please? With where rates are today and where your existing bonds are at, rates would have to rise pretty drastically over the next three months, like a percent and a half for this no longer to be a feasible option mm -hmm. uh, and for you not to be able to save more money than the original proposal that was given about a year and a half ago. Rates would actually need to go up more than 2% for there not to be savings in total. Thank you. Thank you. That being said, there is some upward pressure on rates right now. Yeah. Not to that extent, but it is a matter of you know, 
the longer you wait, the more rates could creep up over the next six months. Thank you. Thank you Commissioner so. Kelly. Bob, I'm not clear on what if we got specific uh, debt we're going to refund or refinance. Yes, it is. And uh, what exactly that is, I cannot tell you, but I would defer to the experts for that. Uh, you know. I, did, I did not. Do you a know if we're going to change the exp expiration date, if that, that, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. of, if, a, if a bond is already going to expire in 2017, that will not change? No, we will not be changing that. A, 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 the, the best analogy I could think of is if you're going to the bank to refinance your house for a better interest rate. I believe that'd be an accurate analogy. So, okay. And and also, if you'd notice the you know the, the first of the year is when, uh, or in September October is when these bonds would be sold, and then at the first of the year is when the benefit would start coming back here, uh, uh, to the county here. So I, I think that, you know, we do have some time here, but I'd still like to get this thing started if the county's to receive the full benefit of what's happening at this time. So the sixty-five thousand dollars will come out. Right away. No, that sixty-five thousand dollars would have come out right away on the original proposal we got a year and a half ago. But this sixty-five thousand dollars will be rolled up into the refinancing. Uh, question, and maybe I, maybe you just said that. So the cost for this is sixty-five thousand, or the cost will be based on the percentage of mon money we save, or how is the how is the cost to the county rolled into this whole thing? The, the uh, the financing fees, from my understanding, is about $65,000 to do this type of a transaction. Uh, when the bonds are sold, however, our, uh, our financial advisor will also uh, get their fees at that time. And that would be regardless of which financial advisor we used. And the financial advisor fees, uh, original, the original uh, uh, request for uh, uh, proposal that I sent out was answered by two of them. One of them was Doherty and Company, and the other one was PFM. I believe Doherty's was $19,500, while PFM's came in at twenty-five dollars or $26,000. And that was just for the fees for the financial advice that we got. Mr. Chairman, Chairman. Commissioner Kelly. Um, when there was a lot of references to Doherty's uh, initial savings versus what, what PFM is saying, they will save us. Yes. Uh, I think PFM calculated theirs in April or in February, one or the other. Uh, when was when was the Doherty proposal made, and did they bring that to us, or did you go out and solicit this? No, they they solicited the auditor's office for that, and it was uh, Doherty it was, did, or I mean, who who originally talked about the refunding? The refunding, the advance refunding, was brought forward by Doherty. The, and this the, is the jail, particularly, right? Or the bonds for the jail. Is that what you're talking about, the bonds for the jail? Mm -hmm. I think some of those bonds are included with this, yes. It's a variety of, of bonds, and I'm not an expert on what's all included in them. I, so so Doherty came to us with this idea. No, Doherty came to us with an advance refunding idea that would have saved the county $868,000, and that would have had double fees on it. Uh, PFM said, wait, and we're going we're gonna to come up with $1.6 million, and you'll have one set of fees on it. So no, this was not Doherty's original idea, although they did, uh, they did contact me about a week ago and ask me what I was going to do, and I told them that this was going to happen, and I was also interested in their current assessment of the situation. I have received no response, and I don't see those folks here today. What? Um, in fairness to that, uh, I think uh, both of them were on vacation last week, but did have uh, access to their emails. If I may. Commissioner Kelly. Um, my understanding is that perhaps Doherty was kind of providing this financial, whatever you call it, in the past as part of their services they weren't charging us for. Is that correct? That's correct. And now we're going to pay somebody to do it? No, we're not going to pay anybody to do anything until we have a movement, an issue of the bonds or a refunding of the bonds. And that would be true of Doherty or PFM. Neither one of the financial advisors. The financial advisor's job is to give us options and, and financial advice uh, and then they, they make their money when we, uh, we do an issue. Or yeah, and was not Doherty doing a good job of that? Well, I would tell you this, uh, Commissioner, that uh, the job that I got with Doherty sounded like it was good on the face of it, and uh, I got a second opinion, and the advice that I got on a second opinion was great advice, and, and I prefer the latter. 
Have we dealt with PFM before? Uh, no, we have not as a county. Uh, I think Doherty has typically uh, uh, done the financial advisor role and then turned around and, and, and done the uh, underwriter role as well. I became aware of uh, PFM uh, when I was on the city council and uh, they did the uh, financial advising on the Lewis and Clark project as well as the levy refunding, I believe. And uh, Jessica, I'd have to defer to you. Are there any other projects that come to your mind with the city? Please come forward. We did not do the Lewis and Clark, but we did do the uh, levy. We've done a refund for the city as well as the uh, entertainment, the, the new center. convention center. Thank you. The new event center. The new event center. Any other questions? Well, I have a question. Uh, Bob, I'm looking at the uh, materials that you submitted, and I'm looking at this August 8th, 2012 memo that looks like something from the CIA. There's all this blacked out language. <laughs> and yeah. there's all these CCs, I count at least six CCs, uh, and I guess so. Uh, what, why, why the... Okay, we're, we're kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but I, I'd like to explain that. And what that is, that, that's, that's point number five. And what that letter is, what that does, is it's a new requirement from the, uh, um, the uh, Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board that requires when somebody is your financial advisor and they change hats to be the underwriter, they sign this letter and send this to you. And what this letter does is tells you that they no longer have to have your financial interests at heart. Okay. That they are operating independently and have their own interests. Okay. And I, I brought that letter along to demonstrate that... Uh, you know, things are changing here in, in the bond market. So it's just a generic letter? It is a generic letter. It was not, this was, this was made out to somebody else there and it was black, it was redacted, uh, okay. you know, to, to cover up any uh, uh, But it, it, wasn't, it wasn't sent to us, though? No, but okay. it could be, uh, depending on uh, the financial advisor that we choose. That's, that's fine. I just thought it was originally sent to us and I thought... Okay. Good, thank you. That takes care of point five. So, um, so do you want to move on and we'll go on to point I, two? I do. Uh, and, you know, the third thing I do is uh, I got a recommendation from the office, uh, the auditor's office, of hiring an independent financial advisor. Now, uh, also today in the audience are two gentlemen. Uh, they're concerned citizens. And uh, I would wonder, and Mrs. Ch Madam Chair, if it would be appropriate if they were able to come forward this time. They have That's some fine. financial expertise and testify on this point. That would be fine. Okay, thank you. Just for clarity of the record, though, nobody's being sworn. Nobody's testifying, but they're doing a presentation. Sorry about, sorry about my terminology. Yeah. Good morning. Could you just identify yourself and your address, please? Good morning. I'm uh, Rich Lauer, and uh, I'm a resident of Sioux Falls at uh, 2017 South Austin Drive. Thanks, Rich. I'm joined this morning by uh, John Fromel. John and I uh, have uh, some experience in the investment banking world. Uh, combined, it's, uh, we added it up this morning, it's 93 years. Mine includes being a senior managing director of a New York Stock Exchange member firm. Uh, John uh, is a retired uh, chief investment officer at Guggenheim Partners, where he was responsible for 26 billion, that's billion with a B, in assets, primarily bonds. Uh, John and I both have the privilege of serving as chair of the South Dakota Investment Council. We're here this morning uh, to speak very briefly on two issues. But before I do, I want to uh, make it crystal clear that neither of us have any financial interest in any of the county's transactions, undertakings. Uh, the issues being discussed this morning will not affect us one way or another, except I would parenthetically tell you in January when my wife and I received our real estate tax notices, we noticed there was a, a slight increase because of an opt-out on the part of the county. Uh, Shirley and I are very supportive of the county's work and uh, the need for that opt-out. I would tell you we are not supportive of uh, the county having a financial transaction, though, that enriches the investment banking community at the expense of the taxpayers of the county. Briefly, uh, there are two issues we'd like to uh, ask you to support. One is uh, the auditor's proposal to hire an independent financial advisor. If you uh, refer to the handbook on debt issuance from the Government Finance Officers Association, I suspect all of you have that handbook. It is uh, eminently clear 
that you should have someone sitting on your side of the table who is an expert representing your interests. Uh, Commissioner Peckus would tell us that uh, if the county was being sued uh, for a substantial amount of money, we would not look to the counsel for the plaintiff to uh, advise us as to what was in our best interest. And it's for that reason that this notion of having an advisor from the investment banking community seek to act as your advisor and then turn around and put on a hat and want to be the underwriter that buys the bonds, it's a conflict of interest that your professional association tells you is basically unresolvable. You cannot expect that someone's going to advise you to the detriment of their best interests. When you have an independent financial advisor sitting with you on your side of the table, whether you sell your bonds competitively or negotiate with an investment banker, someone is there providing the expertise that you do not have and none of you assumed it, that you have to uh, represent the taxpayers of the county. Secondly, we would urge you to uh, consider uh, when you issue debt, doing it competitively, which is something the county has not uh, done heretofore. I think the city of Sioux Falls has had recent experience, starting with the Lewis and Clark bonds. I believe uh, all of the issues subsequent, to, including Lewis and Clark, and subsequent to that have been competitive. On the events center, there was a difference of over $4 million between the best and the most expensive bid when those bonds went to market. You can imagine for a moment if they had negotiated the deal with the firm that happened to provide the uh, offer that would have cost the taxpayers $4 million, where do you suppose those bonds would have been sold? If we were residents of Minnesota or North Dakota, you would be required to sell the bonds competitively. And if you were going to negotiate the deal, you would be required to have the advice of an independent, not an investment banking firm, but an independent financial advisor telling you that it was in your best interest to negotiate the bond sale. And there are some rare, rare instances where negotiated sales are appropriate. And uh, again, this handbook refers to those. But for the vast majority of instances, and particularly with a good credit rating issuer like Minnehaha County, competitive sales are in the interest, best interest of the taxpayers. The I would just conclude, I thought it was interesting this morning, you buy salt based on a competitive bid. When you issue bonds, all you are doing is renting money. You don't care where it comes from as long as, long as George Washington is on all the $1 bills that come into the county's treasury. The bonds can be purchased by a firm in New York or Chicago or Texas. It doesn't make any difference. You want to rent the money at the lowest possible cost, just as you buy salt at the lowest possible cost. I don't mean to oversimplify it, but unless you sell your bonds competitively, you don't know what the true cost of money slash salt was that morning in the marketplace. If there are any questions, John and I would be happy to uh, uh, entertain them. And again, thank you for allowing us a few moments to speak on these issues. Any questions, Jim? Yeah, Rich, I had an opportunity of actually watching some of the testimony when Mr. Blankfein, the head of, uh, I think it was Goldman Sachs, was testifying before, I believe it was the House and the Senate, regarding actually some of the bond sales that, of course, Goldman Sachs was involved in. And one of those requirements was their inability to do exactly what you identified, basically wear the hat of being the proponent of some of the bonds they were selling when they were actually betting against those same bonds on whether or not they were going to be worth what they were actually peddling to individuals. Is that essentially what you're talking about, that, that conflict of interest that's inherent within the system? Well, when, if, you're, if your mission as a, as a business entity is to buy bonds from an issuer at the highest possible interest rate, because the higher the interest rate, the the more saleable that bond is the next that afternoon or the next morning in the marketplace, then that business objective that you have is in conflict with the with the people that 
you propose to buy the bonds from. And the only way to resolve that is to separate that totally. And uh, that's why your professional association says haven't you need an advisor. No one questions that because uh, none of us are expert on the day-to-day, -day, everyday activities in the bond market and the structuring of deals and all of the nuances that are attendant to that. So you need the advisor, but you need an advisor that comes and sits with you on your side of the table just as when, if the, if the county had a uh, big lawsuit, they would retain counsel to represent them. It's exactly the same situation. You cannot expect the party representing someone that's in an adversarial position. This isn't illegal or immoral. Right. Or it's just an adversarial position. You right. cannot expect that party to represent your interest in bears sure. at the same time. Right. John, please. I was just going to say. Come to the microphone, please. Just identify yourself again in your address, please. Thank you. John from Elt, 602 East Garden. Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if uh, Rich, I'm going to jump in over here only because what you just said about Langfeld, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. That's that conflict of interest. Uh -uh. I was just going to say you could have said that. <laughs> 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 All right. Thanks, Jack. That's why you brought me along. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the spirit. Uh, it, I should have let him, he should have come up first, and then we've all been on to the next item of business. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, any other questions? Mr. Kelly. Um, is the size of the bond uh, affect the interest level? I mean, we're, a lot of our bonds are, I'm, the events on it was what, $100 million worth of bonds. I mean, it was a big deal. We're not talking anywhere near that, I don't think, around the county. Um, it, does sometimes the placement of these bonds, because they're if they're only a ten million or five million dollar issue, uh, more difficult? And, I mean, you don't have the interest. You don't have the interest in a small bond sale that you would have in a big one. Is that well? I would defer to, to uh, uh, Jessica is in that she. Or her firm, and my understanding is they represent issuers of all sides. I think, and I don't know whether this speaks to the, the uh, directly to your question, but I believe that the that the threshold in North Dakota and Minnesota is that if you issue over a million, or is that correct, in public debt, that you have to do it competitively. There's some rule, but it certainly isn't uh, is is. Uh, I mean, it doesn't click, kick in at 30 or 40 million dollars, but Jessica can probably respond to that. Now, probably will. <laughs> to that end, there are investors that are interested in all bond sizes. Uh, so, actually, there is an entire investor class of largely banks that are interested in transactions of 10 million or less because they are bank qualified. And so they have additional tax exemptions for those banks. And so part of a transaction isn't, and this goes competitive or negotiated, isn't the size of the transaction. You're not going to get better pricing necessarily for a $100 million deal. It's what sort of investor class that you are seeking. And so there are underwriters and bidders on a competitive basis that primarily focus on only those transactions that are 10 million or less. Um, so there is a, a broad range. Uh, we sell bonds competitively anywhere from 500,000 to 500 million, honestly. Um, Mr. Lauer, thank you so much. I found your presentation compelling. I'm interested in auditing all your future lectures. But <laughs> my question then is... Um, You're not going to be very busy. <laughs> Good, I'm bad at homework. Um, <clears throat> what What's the best way then to choose an independent advisor? I mean, do we put that out for a competitive bid as well then? Or do we just uh, take, you know, what... I mean, how do we decide on, a, on an independent advisor? Well, I've never selected one, uh, uh, Commissioner Burr, so I, 
I really don't have any uh, input in that regard. Uh, I believe the one Mr. Litz is presenting to you today is uh, does work for the city. Uh, I think, and I would stand correct, I think they're the largest in the United States. And uh, my understanding is they're very active in, in uh, Minnesota and North Dakota and, I, and here in, have activity here in South Dakota. So I guess you could certainly consult with others that have retained them and, and ask if they're pleased with their services. But beyond that, I wouldn't know how to put an RFP together. <laughs> I'd be better off asking for assault, then, frankly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Well, Commissioner Kelly? I'm not really, none of, none of Rich. Thank no. you very much. Thank you, Rich. Um, I guess I would like to have Ken give us his views on this thing. It, it, uh, <laughs> I mean, he's our guy, and uh, yeah, I'm uh, sure. I just like, you know, he probably knows more about this than any of us do, and, and uh, unless he doesn't really want to do this Barth? at all. I, I'm not sure Bob is finished with oh, oh, his presentation. Sorry. Yeah, Bob, well, do you I have some? Mr. He's welcome to jump in. Well, if you've got more to go, let, we'll bring Let's Ken in after the, at yeah. the end. Then. Let you finish your points. Okay. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank these two gentlemen for showing up here. These two citizens, their their knowledge is much more in depth than, than mine, and I hope to hope to be that smart someday. But I'm not sure it's going to happen. I don't know if we got that much time left on the clock here. But uh, the fourth thing that I wanted to bring forward uh, was the examination of the contract that was offered by uh, Independent Financial Advisor and Mr. Bartha. Uh, maybe I can help answer part of your question. The school recently did about a month ago or two months ago did RFPs for financial advisors. Only two firms answered that. One was PFM and the other was Doherty. Uh, when I sent out my RFP, that was the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're a, we're a, this is we're a small issuer. We're not. Uh, we're, we're pretty safe, but there's not a lot of people interested in doing our business, to be honest with you. Uh, most of them are looking for bigger, bigger purses. Um, but, uh, you know, I had to, the contract is the same uh, for PFM uh, that it was before. Uh, it's a little bit more expensive by, than Mr. Doherty's, but I would, uh, I would tell you that uh, the fees pale in comparison in, in, in regard to the savings that uh, the one had uh, advised the county to, the route that the county had, had advised uh, us to take. Uh, I also uh, took that contract to Gordy Swanson when he was the state's attorney and then he, uh, he gave it his approval and Kirsten, I forwarded it to Kirsten. Kirsten, I defer to any comments uh, on the contract for you. Oh, uh, may I? Yeah. Uh, the contract's legally sound. I reviewed it for, for those purposes, of course whether you want to proceed on this policy issue, but I have no legal concerns with it, so. Okay, very good. And uh, you know, the other part, folks, uh, today, uh, the two things requested today require action, approval of the, uh, the hiring, you know, as an independent financial advisor, and uh, the approval of going forward with the refunding process. Obviously, Gerald's not here today. I regard this as a big thing, so if this commission, uh, somebody on here would want to wait until we got uh, the full board on to do that vote, why I think that might be uh, the way to go uh, right now. I was not aware when I sent this memo out that Gerald was going to be there. Cindy told me later that day. And uh, the other uh, thing that I did not do was uh, was create a resolution because it created the resolution takes a lot of work. It's probably going to cost some money. And uh, you know, looking at the tenure circumstances we have here, uh, you know, I thought it'd be more appropriate to bring that forward uh, at the time the commissioners would desire that. So, uh, you know, I, I want to remind you that when I got here uh, at the county sitting down in, uh, in this room here, and, and, and Sue was still the auditor, and I, I sat in on the audit things, and I watched this budget crumble uh, one thing at a time. And our thing then was, our mantra was, well, we're going to think outside the box. And just because we did things like we've always done them doesn't mean we have to continue on in that. And I took that to heart, folks. Uh, PFM, uh, they are here because I respect their advice, and they gave, us, they gave me great advice. Uh, not that uh, Doherty and, and company, this does not mean it's the end of our relationship with Mr., uh, you know, the Doherty company. It certainly doesn't. They, they certainly have some roles that they could step into. On uh, the event center uh, thing, you know, the city had PFM, uh, you know, as the advisor on that, and Doherty wound up being part of the, uh, the syndicate that, that, that bought it. So there's still roles out there for them. It just would not be the both hats. And, and quite honestly, I seriously 
uh, have serious reservations about the, the conflict of interest, that somebody's our financial advisor and then they turn around and be the underwriter. That, that, is, that, that it, it, it really bothers me to have that there. You're the commission, you guys can decide what to do with that. Uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's also, uh, you know, we would pay the consequences if, if things aren't uh, going quite as uh, they should be. And I would also say that, uh, you know, over the years, uh, you know, the, the Doherty firm, uh, they're very, very respected, but, but you know, the city changed their, their thing about this. Recently, the school did not, uh, but I also had a conversation with uh, Mr. Vick, who's their, their finance officer, and uh, he is under the impression that uh, Doherty Company, that hired them as a financial advisor, was barred by law to uh, be the underwriter, and I told him that was not the case. So what their situation is down there has yet to unfold. I don't know what it is. So, But... Uh, Folks, I, I guess that's the end of my presentation here. I think this is the, you know, I, I presented this about a year ago, tried it. Uh, you guys uh, didn't see any merit in it at the time. Uh, I was afraid to let our financial portfolio go unattended should have something have happened, but we lucked out and here we are today. Uh, and then a couple of months ago, I think I individually gave all of you this basic packet here. The only change in that packet is that the, the money actually got a little bit better since we waited from that time. So unless there's any other questions, I guess that would conclude my presentation here today. Any other comments? Commissioner Barr? I have a couple questions, Bob. And, you know, I got to say that having gotten this in our packet on Friday, and with yesterday being a, a holiday, I really haven't been able to review it as carefully as I'd like. I mean, it's 10 pages long, and as uh, Commissioner Peck has pointed out, you know, some of it is uh, pretty heavily redacted. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I guess. Uh, uh, it, it does seem like a little bit of a rush to try to make an approval on this today. I would say that uh, I noticed a reference to LIBOR, which, uh, you know, that's still, in my opinion, uh, subject or uh, exposed to manipulation by those folks that uh, are uh, have been manipulating it in the past. And I, I don't know exactly. Uh, I, I read it in the, the word in here somewhere. I couldn't find it just now when I went back, but. Uh, you know the uh, <clears throat> the uh, I don't spend my days uh, working on uh, uh, on the banking issues normally, so it's uh, it's a little bit uh, dense for me. Um, I would say that uh, you got an email from them or a letter from uh, uh, your proposed client here uh, on February 8th, and then you emailed them back with a little chain of emails on May 10th. So that means that. You know, uh, March and April, you weren't in any contact with them. Well, we were, but uh, what we were doing at that time was Highway uh, had some uh, some proposals and they needed some numbers for them. I think uh, I think the uh, not the JDC, but the uh, Community Correction Center. We doubled up, we ponied up on one of those. So we have been getting advice from PFM on possible issues uh, that uh, we could be doing. And there is no cost to the county on that until you, unless you would decide to do an issue and if you would decide to use them as your financial advisor. They did that for us gratis, and I think it was a, it was a good faith effort to show uh, what they're capable of. I guess, you know, it just made me kind of wonder about that uh, gap in communication. Then. Well, there was, there, was very, there. there was very little to do until the time come due on this year. And there's, there's no reason for the gap in communication. As a matter of fact, uh, like I say, we did have it, just wasn't about this. The only thing that could change uh, as far as the circumstance would go was the numbers. And like I said, those numbers actually got better during that time. The, the savings to the county actually increased during that time. Like I say, the timeline that we were looking at, you know, it's it's you, we can we can we can go on a couple three weeks or maybe a month or so, but you know, the timeline is the timeline. If you want to get this done by the first of the year, we're going to have to move on it fairly soon. And like I said, I mean, we, we do have a little bit of time. So. I, I agree with you. The Lieber rate, uh, the big banking. I see everybody's back to doing. There a lot of people are back to doing derivatives and all these things that seem to put the country in a in a in a tough spot to begin with. Uh, I, I you know even with the the, the big reform uh, act that was uh, purported to be out there, they're winning their way through that and banks are fighting it. Uh, it's, it's a real, real dogfight out there. And I'm not certain from my point of view or from what I've read that there's much been changed in big banking. Uh, we're kind of still at that same spot, Jeff. I agree with you. And it's a little bit frightening to me. I'm going to make a comment. Dick, did you have another one? Yeah, this is just a comment. Um, I'd ask Ken to come up, but I, I'm just still not comfortable with this whole thing. Uh, there's been a relationship with Doherty, and I haven't 
I still can't get my hands around what's going to cost where. Um, if, if we deferred this until June 25th, it would, one, give, uh, it would give the Doherty people who, as I understand you said, were out of town this weekend, That's both correct. of them. It's a Memorial Day weekend, and that's understandable. Uh, uh, I would like to hear from them again. I know they weren't; they were here when you made your presentation, but they didn't make any remarks. Um, and and at that time, I think between now and then, Ken can maybe perhaps advise the commission on where his stand is on this, rather than make him stand up now. Which he didn't know I was going to do anyway. So <laughs> it's I, I well then maybe it would be an opportunity for Ken to to uh, give us his opinion on this. Um, not that we don't trust yours, Bob, but I you know I think also Ken is our guy, and and you know it's, sometimes you have to look to the person that's working directly for you to for advice too. If if you wouldn't mind, Ken. Mr. And Chair, uh, Madam Chair, and Commissioner, I would tell you, I'm your guy too. I work for you. I understand. I, I understand that. I understand and, that. But and, and Ken and I also had this observation, or had this conversation Thursday, and he says it's your baby, Bob. <laughs> you know, he doesn't want much to do with it. Well, that's why I asked him to come up. Um, commissioners, you know, and again, you know, I recognize. Uh, this is, as an elected official, the auditor, this is, you know, a chief call of his to make a recommendation on how you proceed. I mean, I do see great value in the fact of retaining an independent financial advisor. This, that's been recommended by uh, Mr. Lauer. I know that's an, of interest to, to Bob as well. And, you know, Bob, um, from what he's told me, has done his diligence as far as doing some uh, comparison and that between proposals, you know, a proposal, but I will remind you, you have not done a formal RFP for this process, and I don't believe, and I haven't been privy or seen anything of a side-by-side -side comparison on what the results of, you know, a review of the proposals have been, and that may have some merit, but again, you know, I haven't been involved with that, and I did reiterate to Bob that's his process. One of the things that um, does strike me, though, as we take a look at this and some of the potential savings and where I think we do have to give a little consideration to is how that will impact uh, our future capital improvement schedules that we have. And, that, and if there's an opportunity to review what those savings may be and how it might help us in some other projects, you know, uh, uh, that we bring to the table, um, I think that's a benefit to take a look at. You know, unfortunately, we're not going to be ready to do that until we do our budget hearing schedules coming down the pike here, which are going to be starting here and hopefully mid-June. And, you know, building and the capital improvement schedule is one key item that we take a look at. So uh, uh, perhaps before you make some sort of a decision on what, um, you know, particularly as it relates to the refunding app, you know, portion of the proposal, because I see there's two different things here. But particularly as it relates to the refunding and whether to go through is how does this impact our other um, our bond schedules that we have in our capital improvement plan? What kind of uh, ability does this free up for us to do some other things within the the, the capital improvement plan, et cetera? But um, that's my two cents worth. Thank you. I have a comment if you're done. Bob, did you have another comment? Uh, no, I just want to say Mr. McFarland's absolutely right, and uh, Jessica from PFM has uh, referred to that several times, that our debt structure would depend on what we want, uh, how to arrange that. There's a number of ways of doing it. I don't have that expertise. She certainly does. Her firm certainly does, and would offer us an array of options in that area. I just wanted to say, I, you know, I don't think any of us thinks that we're financial advisors nor understands even the beginning of it. I see a lot of merit in going forward and doing something like this, but I also feel like we need to work it into our budget process, which we're going forward with. I don't really want to see a date of June 28th or whatever put on it because we don't know where we're going to be at when we're do it when we're working through our budget I would like to see it deferred to the budget process. We can figure it out as we go along what point we're going to put that in there. I'm afraid if you put us on a date right now, we may end up being the same thing and deferring it another week or two. Um, I do see a lot of merit in this. We were elected were elected officials to protect our citizens' tax money and to 
be the policy makers for this. Um, and I think we should move forward. I just don't know that today is the day to make a decision on that, particularly with Gerald gone to this is a, discuss a, a uh, discussion for all five of us to have. And Gerald did uh, make those same observations to me, and I, I know they're true. Uh, just looked at the data on this here, and I did want to bring it forward. Uh, we, like I said, uh, Commissioner Barr said he wanted some more time to think it over, and uh, that was uh, since there's not all, everybody's here today. Uh, you know, I would uh, respectfully request that we defer any votes on these things for uh, a period of three weeks, and then uh, at that point, maybe we come back and look at it again and decide if we need some more time. Uh, meanwhile, what I would do is is keep in touch with. PFM, since uh, they've been very generous with their time to us so far, and see what uh, see what that might result, or if there's any consequences or advantages to doing that. I'll make a motion to defer defer for three weeks. I have a second. Do you have a second? Anybody like to make a substitute motion? Um, it's not a substitute. It isn't the other motion did not. The motion failed. It would seem to me that maybe this is the time to table this. It leaves it on the table uh, for bring, we can bring it up at whatever date we feel is appropriate or work with it, let the auditor's office. Um, it doesn't kill it. It leaves it there. And uh, I think I'm not sure what the rules say on bringing it back up, but uh, I don't think that would be a problem. That way, and then we don't get stuck into a date if we want to do it the middle of August after the whole budget is pretty well set up. Like, so my motion would be to table. I have a motion to table. Do I have I'll a second? second. I have a motion and a second to table. I'll, Mr. Barth? Um, I guess my thought would be I'd like to discuss it some more as soon as next week. I really think this, uh, uh, you know, we don't have to make a decision next week either, but uh, perhaps those that are on vacation would have some input. And um, I, I guess there's some other points I would make, but that's my... I, I am. Uh, I, I wanted to mention yeah. that, Madam Chair. I'm, uh, I have to go to Rapid City to observe an election, okay. and uh, I would certainly like to be present for that. And then I would also comment, I know what happens when you table something out the legislature, and I'm not all that familiar with Robert's Rules of Order for tabling something. That's why I would prefer the word uh, defer, uh, and that means we're just going to put it off. It's the same effect. Uh, same effect? If, if it, in, in, the, in the legislature, they will table or defer to the 41st day, which is the day after the legislature meets. And uh, but just tabling a motion leaves it out there, and and it, for that very reason, you know, Jeff suggested next week, and you said you're out of town, so uh, that was the purpose of my motion to table would be simply to leave it there. Uh, it can be brought back for discussion at any point, and, and uh, it just allows a little more flexibility. Fair enough. Any other comments? Again, I guess I. I if, if not the fourth, then I would go for the eleventh. <laughs> well, um, Commissioner, <laughs> I guess uh, I, I seconded the. I, I thought Bob requested three weeks. I thought that seemed to be very lucid, and it made sense. But apparently, it failed. Uh, so, without that uh, lucidity or reason being at the table, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll uh, obviously uh, second the tabling of this. I think it's important that. Mr. Beniga is present uh, for this discussion, and I also think that, you know, even our, our friend from PFM indicated that we have a couple of months here before the rates are actually changing, and I think it's important for us to have a discussion to look at how we get the best bang for the buck, and the longer we wait is the fire in which we burn, and I think that it's important to take that into consideration. So you can call it table, you can call it deferring but I I guarantee you that Commissioner Barth is going to make a motion to bring it from the table and I'll be supportive of it so the, the point of order do we need yes. uh, a, a super majority or simple majority to bring something off the table simple majority okay we have a motion and a second on the table sure. I'd, I'd like to make another comment okay. about the whole thing <laughs> uh, which is I do like uh, this this suggestion um, I do think that it was a bit of a rush to try to get this done, having received this uh, in our packets just three days ago. Um, I also think that no matter how thin you slice it, there's two sides to a piece of toast. And so there, there is another side to this I'd like to, to hear more about. And I guess that's my comments. Okay. 
We have a motion and a second to defer. Any other comments? No, actually tabled. Tabled, sorry. <laughs> Get the words right. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes four to zero. We will see it again. Thank you, Commission. Mm -hmm. Item 17 is a briefing and follow-up discussion on FY 2014 long-range plan. Preliminary budget overview material. Ken McFarland. <coughs> Commissioners, uh, last week uh, after the commission meeting, we did a, an overview session of where we find ourselves going into the budget hearing process for 2014. We had supplied you with a number of different uh, documents for your perusal, and that they, uh, they range from some of our um, long range plan presentations to all the way to some of our projections for. Uh, our rev new revenues going into the next year, some discussion on our means of finance of where we would be, an overview of, of new personnel hires, etc. I will remind you that budgets are due from, from departments here at the end of the week on May 31st, and there will be more than likely, um, on the basis of the discussion we had last week, some of those things that may in fact change, you know, in what's actually submitted for budget prep. Um, you had specifically requested that or an opportunity uh, after you had a chance to read uh, some of those documents, um, specifically requested a chance to come back and uh, have this time to discuss anything that you had questions on. You know, just to remind you a couple of the critical things that we think are of importance to you. Uh, our initial revenue estimates are approximately uh, $900,000 in general fund revenues um, going into the new year. A key discussion that you're going to have to have is since we now have really gained our footing back on our cash balance within the general fund, it's, it's not hugely, it, it, it's not, you know, the sky's the limit, but it is definitely better than what it was in 2011 and 2012 when we were going through some very, very tough times. One of the key decisions you're going to have to make is how much of that cash balance and that, that you are going to use for the cash applied. And that and that'll be a key factor. But I want you to remember it's a, you know, and it's my opinion that one of the reasons you built up some of that cash is so that you can use that as a resource to fund, you know, ongoing budgets, and that's why departments have done a lot of work in that regard to help restore that cash balance. So what that amount is remains to be seen once we see the final budget numbers. But again, we wanted this opportunity, or you had requested this opportunity if there was anything on the uh, um, on the long range plan stuff or the budget overviews that you would want to take a look at once you've had more chance to, to review it. So we went over some of our building or our projected building projects that we see on the horizon. Um, you know, Bob alluded to some of the debt service calculations that we're doing, and we're continuing to refine some of those. You know, as we get further in, as we get further information. So, uh, and again, this is just your opportunity for any questions that you may have had from that from that presentation. This was suggested by Commissioner Benega that we just have an opportunity to ask any further questions at this point, and so I'll just open it up. Does anybody have any comments, Commissioner Kelly? Well, just. I mean, there's an awful lot of pages and an awful lot of departments yes. there. But but looking at them, one, we had 26 employee requests, which I believe was somewhere in the tune of a million and a half, million six, something like that. Uh, not including, well, that did include STEP, I guess, in it. But uh, It did not. It did not include that STEP. Did not. Those so, were just so, higher requests. And STEP is another 400? Close, yes. Yeah. Um, generally, the budgets, not all of them, but a lot of most of them sit, seem to sit there in that four to six percent increase over last year, and our revenue increases are going to be somewhere around one and a half percent. Is that fair to say? Uh, our initial calculations, if I correct, in the general fund, and that was about one point nine. By the time we factored in, you know, the property tax increases, but we've also got some, and you know, the new growth and the CPI. But we've also got 
some declines in revenue that have been projected, you know, in our non-property tax revenue. Mm -hmm. So that's expenses. where we're getting the 1.9. That's why I said, you know, it's important to take a look at your policy that you've had the last couple of years about getting that cash applied number that was no greater than the 5% uncollectible allowance that has had, and coupled with the department heads work to control expenses, that has had the, the, the impact of pumping up our cash balances. And, that, and, and in, historically in years past, cash applied was always higher than that 5%. And I think it can be again going into to the next budget year. Do I think we can approach anywhere like what we did in the years past for cash applied? Absolutely not. But it is an additional resource beyond the 1.9% increase in revenue that we've projected in this um, going forward. But, but I do think that, you know, after going through the last two or three years, um, we don't want to drain down that cash number Absolutely anywhere not. like what we got, which means you can't always use it. Sometimes you got to leave it there to make sure that if you get another recession. Well, just to give you some perspective, commissioners, if you go back and look at general fund cash applied in some of the years uh, prior to some of the difficult financial situations we were in, we were routinely running cash applied numbers in the neighborhood of five and sometimes approaching six. Now this, um, this last go around um, for 2013, because of some of the policies that we implemented during the budget hearings about keeping that number low and matching up with the 5% uncollectible allowance, I believe the general fund cash balance, this is somewhere around 2.1 and that's so, um, that, that again, that work along with the efforts of the departments to control expenses has pumped up our cash balance, which is exactly what you wanted to do to get us stabilized. It, it's having the exact effect. My only point in saying that, Commissioner, is just to remind you that cash, even though it's a function of cash flow for us, and that's all important because we don't have the ability like many governments to set up, quote, our rainy day reserve fund and say, yep, here's our savings account. We don't get to do that. And that cash flow is so important to us, but it is still a resource that you can use to fund your budget. And determining what that right number is is going to be key as we go forward. I think it can be higher than but the 5%. But you can't use it if you don't have it. And that, but my point is we we have, in fact, built it up into levels that we have seen prior to us being in the dumps. Well, we've done that. Yeah. And, and, and I, you know, I think we talked about the reserve, or the, the 5% deal, but I, if I recall, it was more of a, we, will, we don't want to spend more than what it is. Doesn't mean we can't spend less. That's correct. To, to, to still get this, this thing a lot more. But once less. you establish what it is, then what it becomes is the, what really is the controlling factor in the budgets is controlling the expenses mm -hmm. because you're matching up your projected revenue with cash and other revenue and property taxes to what your expenses are. And then, so beyond that, then once you start controlling expenses, it has the same effect of, you know. And uh, the elephant in the room is that personnel is what, 60 correct five percent or whatever it is of, of the expenses. And so one of the reasons I wanted to point out See, if you take a look, and this is what's encouraging, um, and Bob talked about this uh, last week, if you go to the sheet, which is our general fund cash balance report, and this is what's encouraging to me, and it's, again, indicative of the policy changes that you made plus the work of the departments. Um, if you go back and take a look at where historically we've been, and that Where's that at, Ken? And that uh, it's on your Dropbox. It's under Budget Overview, and it's the very first spreadsheet, and that that's there. It's labeled as 1A. Oh, okay. Okay. So if you look at that, and that, and you can see at the end of April, we were at 11 and a half million dollars in our general fund cash apply. Now we used to think that we were in some pretty good years in 2008 and 2009 before we started to see some problems and that in our, in our cash started tailing off. 
So as you can see, at $11.5 million, that is the second highest total that we've been at during that time of year since 2007. And that uh, 2009 was the high point at the end of April at 11.7. And we will start seeing what's what I really want to see is how we end up at the in, end of May. Because then all the property taxes are in. You know, that's generally a peak time for revenue for us. And as you can see, uh, May has typically been our flush time. So we'll have a good handle on where we're really at at the end of May and to see if this is a trend and whether or not we have, in fact, stabilized ourselves, which I, I think we will. You'll see that. And that's so, but right now, the way we're trending, we are absolutely much better than what we were in 11 and 12, which were some really, really tough times for us. So I'm just saying that, um, in my opinion, based on historical trends, um, that I think it is prudent to use a portion, not all, and certainly not to the extent that we used to, but that it's prudent to use some of that cash to apply towards a budget in addition to the 900,000 new revenue that we're forecasting. Again, the trick is going to be how much are you comfortable with doing. And that, and you know, once we see all the final numbers as we prep the budget, that's one of the things that we do um, when we first, when we get all the numbers together is we'll come in and we will tell you. In fact, we did it last year and we'll say, we believe that the cash applied number can be no higher than this if we're going to stabilize. And if I'm not mistaken, when we did that last year, we were, we were said we would be comfortable with pushing almost three, three million dollars of cash applied. You settled for 2.1, but we did come in at that time and said, we think you can push three. So, I mean, we will do that as part of the budget overviews that we will do once we get all the numbers in. So, but I just wanted, you know, again, it's my opinion, you can use that as a resource. Commissioner Barth? I just would say that uh, economists are known as practitioners of the dismal science, and I'd like to join Commissioner Kelly in urging uh, uh, all of us to deflate our expectations until we see what we can do. And again, we will do that once we get the numbers in. But, you know, looking at where we're tracking so far and that um, we're in a better situation and a better discussions than what we were in 2011 and 2012. Any other questions, comments? But all those documents, and they will stay in that Dropbox area for you so that you can refer back to them, et cetera. So those aren't disappearing at all during the budget hearing process. You will have access to all of that information all the way through the hearing processes. One of the things that you'll start seeing this week too, now that we've got them, we're going to be dumping in the outside agency requests, you know, the, so that you can at least start familiarizing yourself with those. And that, and you know, and we ask for increased information from those folks this, this time around. So. You'll have all that, like, that should be on your Dropbox by the end of the week. And, that, but, uh, and those will stay through. So May 31st is the deadline for submitting budgets. And uh, very shortly after that, you know, we will, you know, the auditor's office will start, you know, plugging in the numbers and saying, all right, here's, here's the total. Here's what it looks like. Um, we sent you a copy. Uh, Marie sent you copies of a spreadsheet to try to indicate what days you are available to meet, what time frames in order to do budget hearings. Typically, once we get those all back from you, and I would urge you to try to get those back to us by the end of this week, we will start setting the blocks of time when we see that you're all available to do it. And we'll schedule the initial overview session, and then we'll start scheduling hearings. And that's it. so we'll have the blocks of times locked in. I think most of those are in, so we should know very soon very when soon. we are going to be meeting to move forward. Correct. Any other comments? Well, I guess we'll move on to our next budget meeting then. Cindy? Our next item is Minnehaha County Commissioner Liaison Reports. Any reports on liaisons? Commissioner Bart. I, this could be as much under new business as uh, liaison reports, but uh, I went to an airport event and I was the only commissioner there. 
and uh, it was they're, they're doing great things at our airport here in uh, Minnehaha County, and uh, the future looks uh, well, uh, looks good as well. Uh, an additional item, I went to the Lewis and Clark annual uh, business meeting. and uh, um, Did it wake? <laughs> well, let's just say that in, uh, 208 years ago, Lewis and Clark came through this area, and in another 208 years, we'll have their project done. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I would like us to uh, consider writing a letter to our uh, federal legislators and to our chief executive on behalf of the Lewis Clark and Clark project. And I'd like the uh, tonight. I will suggest that the city uh, do the same thing. I talked to Greg Jameson about it briefly, and you know, just a renewed effort on our part to. Uh, encourage uh, progress on this because they're getting enough money to like uh, keep, have a pulse but not enough to uh, yeah. to dig and uh, keep the so I, I guess uh, if you would allow me I'd make a motion to ask us to write a letter uh, to support the Lewis and Clark funding I I'll a motion. Second. got a motion and a second to write a letter to the federal legislators and, and the chief executive and chief executive regarding Lewis and Clark funding. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Thank Thanks, you, Jeff. That would be good. Any other um, liaison reports? Well, just a comment on the airport. Uh, the week before, CCOG had a, uh, I think it was a U that's about planning maybe was it that had the uh, they had the tour and the tour was the airport and we got an opportunity to go way behind the scenes I had no idea we had a baggage system like they've got out there it's like what you see in the movies but uh, um, it was it, it was yeah it, it we could be proud of that airport and even though it's sort of a city deal and the key points the uh, commissioners uh, uh, it's a benefit to the county, to the whole area. So, but you missed a good one there. Yeah. Uh, if nothing else, we'll move on to new business. Is there any new business? Madam Chair. Yes. In as much as uh, Pastor uh, Jeff is here, um, I would like to ask him if he would uh, address us. Apparently, he came to speak to us. Did you come to speak to us? Okay, Pastor Hayes, you want to take the microphone and identify yourself, please. <laughs> I'm uh, Pastor Jeff Hayes from Faith Temple Church. Uh, my home address is 2325 South Woodbine Lane here in Sioux Falls. And uh, I'm sorry about barging in and not being on the agenda. I do appreciate all the work that you do, and I appreciate the time that you're giving me this morning. <clears throat> I was going to go to the church, but I felt just kind of pushed down this way. And so I don't know if it's a divine thing or it was the pizza I ate last night, mm -hmm. but uh, could have been that. Um, I did send a letter out to you last week, and I don't know if you had a chance to read it or not. It has to do with the uh, Nordstrom Johnson building out at the Sioux Empire Fairgrounds. And uh, Art Marie um, Nordstrom donated this building to the fairgrounds and uh, to be used by the Faith Temple Food Giveaway on Fridays. Um, the building, I believe, uh, of course, is uh, owned by the fairgrounds as well as the county. I got a little note from the mayor, and uh, I just picked up uh, uh, something from him that he thought it was a private building, and uh, that uh, you know it, the funds that were needed needed to continue to be raised privately. And what's in need there is uh, the building is complete as of like this week, and uh, but it does need the utilities to be hooked up as well as a fence to be built so that building could be used uh, by people that rented. Uh, and they can just come in the north gate and use the building um, separate from the rest of the fairgrounds. Uh, but I grasp from the mayor's note to me that um, many people think that it's a private building and it doesn't belong to the county of the fairgrounds. And I don't know if you all know that it does belong to the fairgrounds and to the county. Um, I believe, and uh, Scott Wick could talk to you probably uh, in a more direct way about the amount of money that needs to be raised but it's about I believe about $35,000 to put the electricity water and sewer and to build this fence and then the building will be functional and it'll be usable right now the building kind of sets there and it can't be rented um, I also want to encourage you to consider um, paying for the utilities and the fence because then the fairgrounds can um, start to rent the building out 
and that uh, uh, people will be paying rent. And so I believe that you would recoup your investment rather quickly uh, because this building will be uh, highly sought after to uh, have events in. I could go on and on. I do that every, <laughs> every Sunday, so, but I wasn't sure if you had any questions for me. I was going to mention to you, too, that uh, some folks have a misconception about the uh, food giveaway that we have there, typically, you know, almost every week. And uh, many people believe that, uh, uh, you know, we just use the building, uh, the armory, uh, without paying rent. We do pay rent for the, uh, the food giveaway to have it there. And also, we'll continue to pay a rent uh, at the new building, uh, the uh, Nordstrom Johnson building. Uh, and so we're just not getting a free ride there, but we also pay rent and will contribute to the investment of, of course, the utilities being put in if you, if you choose to do that. Uh, appreciate the city. They are uh, paving around the building. And uh, so they've uh, even invested some things uh, into making that building functional. Commissioner Kelly. Kelly. Um, I went out there the other day and looked at it. it it's, it's not... Uh, there's no frills in this thing, but it's very functional, and it, it's going to be a good asset out there. Um, I don't believe we've had a formal request. Now, the letter I got was to the mayor, and I was copied on it. Yeah. Is that um, so? My thought was probably that right now it's in the mayor's, and I don't know whether he's indicated whether he's willing to do any more or not. Um, at one time, it was there was questions asked about maybe the city and the county going halves on the thing. At this point, it would be a shame that $35,000 is holding it up, and I understand they haven't had any luck with private donations. There doesn't seem to be an interest level there. That, uh, and I would think if a formal request came in, even as early as next week, that we could then act on a possible loan or, or a, a grant or whatever to them. But, yeah, it, you know, it, to an extent, it's our building because it's on our property, and uh, I, I, it'd be a shame to have the 35. The Nordstroms have stuck an awful lot of money into this thing, and uh, and I don't think the Nordstrom should. I don't think they should go back and ask for that. It was clear from the beginning that that they were going to build the building and that there'd have to be other sources. Am I correct on that, Cindy? The other resources that would uh, uh, provide the things like and the city did the asphalt that lot which is going to be a big deal so uh, but my only comment is that there there has not to my knowledge been a formal request and that we can act on so, and uh, we may want to relay that on to to uh, Scott too because I know he was in and briefed us but from there nothing happened and I'm sure he'd be more than willing to give you a formal request on that Commissioner Barth. Um, I did uh, sit next to the mayor at lunch the other day and uh, asked him about this, and he said no. Now, that said, he may not have understood that uh, this is not a private building. Uh, so, uh, But on the, on the other hand, they're also doing lots of other things at the fairgrounds, and, uh, you know, we have to give them credit for that. Now, we, on the other hand, have uh, spent uh, many millions of dollars at the fairgrounds over the years. And uh, although it's our property and stuff, uh, we're not exactly loaded with, with, with money. I do think that there's opportunities to raise this kind of money uh, privately. Uh, I've been to fundraisers which raised tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, and I've also, uh, uh, I know that part of that is also getting the word out. Mm -hmm. And so I think that an opportunity like this to uh, speak uh, it's unfortunate we don't have more media here today, but uh, maybe we could if we had it on our agenda, um, you know, get a little more publicity for the project that truly needs to be completed so that we can fully utilize it. And uh, <coughs> uh, that's what I know. Well, to, to gear up for raising $35,000, <laughs> sometimes it could cost you twenty five just to gear up for it. It's, it's difficult on a small amount like that, and it's, uh, I think they expected maybe somebody would come forward and didn't. Uh, uh, I think it's important that we get this thing online, though, and and get the water sewer and, and fence, fencing. And I think the fencing is very important, uh, particularly I think we should pay attention. The, the city has, asphalting that lot is a big, mm -hmm. I would guess, a pretty big deal. I mean, look, look at the lot down by the expo building and, 
uh, I, this is going to be much more attractive than that. So uh, I would hope that we get a request and we could, could act on it. I think I'd work some way of getting the money to them quickly so they can get it done. If I could comment just for a second, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Bart's uh, comments. Um, the the Argus leader as well as uh, Kello did a news story about the private funds needing to be raised, but nothing really came. And so it was kind of dead in the water. Um, also, I think uh, I, I did send another letter to the uh, the mayor saying that the uh, the building itself isn't a private building. It is uh, owned by the, the, the fairgrounds and the county, and so he may have a different view on it now. Um, I think it'd be a wonderful investment uh, for, uh, you know, if it be the city or the commission to work together to make this happen. Uh, just speaking from our food giveaway, a lot of people don't know actually uh, concerning that. A lot of people think that we just receive the food and we give it out and it's no cost to us. Um, typically a food giveaway that we do once a week, and I realize that this building will be used more than just for us, but the food giveaway that we do, uh, including the Argus Leader milk, typically costs about $3,000 a week to put on at the, uh, at the fairgrounds. And so uh, I, I see that as an asset to the county and the state and the city because uh, those governments do refer people to us that are in need. Uh, but once again, I, I don't want to talk a lot about the food giveaway because it's just one thing that will happen at that building uh, maybe once a week. Also, um, Art Marie signed an agreement that if the fairground gets a better offer to use that building uh, that uh, Commissioner Kelly saw the other day, then we would be bumped to the armory to do the food giveaway and the funds that uh, uh, would be generated by the new building on a Friday when we typically would be there uh, would still be received by the fairgrounds and we would be moved over to the, the armory. So I think it's a win-win situation, but to prolong it um, is, is detrimental because that building just sits there <coughs> then and it can't be rented. It was pretty clear though the Nordstrom's had two two missions there. One was to the fair, the other was yeah. to your, your food giveaway. and. Uh, yeah. I believe he's a member of your church. Yeah. Uh, As Lee's under the fair, I just have a couple of comments. This is a nonprofit building. The fair is a nonprofit. This is built by donations specifically, and that was kind of how we went into it in the beginning, knowing that it needed to be donations. And I do think it's a lack of people understanding and knowing. I'm going to refer it back to or compare it to when the bookmobile was cut in 2001. That happened in well, September, basically, of 2001, and it was $85,000, I believe, Ken, and that money was raised by the Friends of the Bookmobile in less than three months, and it was phone calls. And it was phone calls, phone calls, phone calls. And I think po the phone calls I had, I don't think anybody turned me down when I said, this is what it is, this is a nonprofit, you know, the, f the county can't afford the fair, or I can't afford the bookmobile, and people stepped forward, and I think people, if they understood this was a nonprofit, and you're right, it's not just for the food giveaway, which is huge, we need it for that, but they can also rent this out for wedding receptions or other things, there's, you know, a shortage of places to have large events in Sioux Falls, there's great parking out there, there's a lot of advantages to having it as a revenue source for a nonprofit fairgrounds. So it is, it is a huge need, but I think it's more people don't know that they just donate 50 bucks. It helps. So, Ken, did you have some comments? No, I, and I'm not sure how you want to go with this, but I just wanted you to... Ken, could you step to the mic? Yes. Just so that you kind of know where things are, I know I've had a couple questions about this, and um, I just wanted to make sure that... Uh, Right now, in the county's building project list for 2013, excuse me, and you have money that's been allocated to the Fair Association and that for some work out there, but I want to reiterate, it's out of the building fund. One is to do the uh, HVAC renovations that are currently underway, mm -hmm. and that we had $140,000 for that. Um, that may come in a little bit less, you know, we're, we're not, we're, they're working on the contracts now. I know that my last conversation with Scott, they ran into some issues. Um, you had 20000 allocated for asphalt, but like you said, the city is doing some work. So here about a month or so ago, you reauthorized them to do some other uses for that money. And that, and they're in the plans of doing that. And they're working, and then specifically some 25000 for some door rehab. Mm -hmm. If you were going to consider a request like Commissioner Kelly has done, I mean, 
there's really two approaches that you could do. And that one, if you're inclined to do it this year, that is going to require a notice of hearing with a posted amount to do a supplement to the building fund in order to, to take care of it. And that, you know. The other one, if you are inclined, um, you know, I've got a number of projects that the fair has requested for coming up years. And that, and that is something that you could build into the building fund in other years too, if you're inclined to do this kind of thing. So if you're inclined to do it, you've either got to do a supplement this year or you've got to build it somewhere into the budget. So Ken, you said 2014. Did you mean 2013? 2013 is what we have right yeah. now. And that, you know, so there is some money there. But there, yeah. it's committed so, money. I was going to say, comment on that is that the Fair Board would not be in favor of you taking the right. money they've committed to other projects and moving it. We've had they've that discussion, and that money things. has been committed to specific That's projects. That's why I said it would have to require yeah. more than likely, if you're inclined to do this, a supplement of some sort to, to do the work. So, because it is committed money. Right, it's committed money. And I think going, I just want to reiterate, going into this, we realized that this was probably not money coming from the county. The county has given a ton of money to the fairgrounds, and we wanted this to be an outside people donating to build this building. I want to see it done as much as anybody else do. I'm on the fair board working towards this. But it, before we had outside, I mean, the idea was to get outside people to donate to finish this up, and it does need to be finished. And that might take a lot of phone calls. Any other comments? Thank you, Pastor Hayes. Um, I think we can move on to any other new business? Any old business? Move adjournment. Uh, for exactly. executive session? Yeah. Well, we do have executive For personnel? For personnel. Yeah. So I have a motion. Second. Motion is second to move to executive session for personnel. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes 5 to 0. Thank you. Motion